This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue our coverage of the Rikers Island Jail, in October, a memorial service was held for Vanita Browder, who died, as her family said, of a broken heart, 16 months after her own son, Khalif, hanged himself in his Bronx home after spending nearly three years at New York's Rikers Island Jail. In 2010, when Khalif was just 16, he was sent to Rikers Island without trial on suspicion of stealing a backpack. He always maintained his innocence and demanded a trial. He spent the next nearly three years at Rikers, even though he was never tried or convicted. For nearly 800 days of that time, he was held in solitary confinement. Near the end of his jail time, the judge offered to sentence him to time served if he simply entered a guilty plea. He told him he could face 15 years in prison if he went to trial and was convicted. But Khalif was insistent. He still refused to accept the plea deal. He was only released when the case was dismissed. While at Rikers, Khalif was repeatedly assaulted by guards and other prisoners. He also told Huffington Post Live he was repeatedly denied food by guards while he was in solitary. These experiences traumatized him. Ultimately, after his release, Khalif Browder took his own life on June 6, 2015, when he was 22 years old. For more, we're joined by Akeem Browder, Khalif's older brother, founder of the campaign to shut down Rikers. Akeem, welcome to Democracy Now! It's really good to have you with us. And our condolences on the death of your mom, Vanita, and of your brother, Khalif. That is a lot to take in. Yeah, thank you for having me. I, uh, um, as I, I let people know, I, I, I'm hoping that people realize that this, the system has claimed already two, and I say the system, but I, I'm going to put a face to it. De Blasio, our mayor, um, Mayor De Blasio has, has already claimed two of my family members, and it's not, it's not a. Uh, a confusion as to why. I mean, depression runs fr um, runs thoroughly in, in in our family because of what happened to Khalif and anxiety and stress. And my mother, through her heart attack that just took her life uh, last week, my mother constantly kept on letting it be known that they took her boy, they took her son, and all she wanted was a, someone to take it. A, a, um, a stance and say, yes, I, I'm responsible. She wanted someone to be responsible for um, her son's loss. Take <clears> us <throat> through what happened. Uh, Khalif is a 16-year-old, lives in the Bronx. He's picked up. The police say he stole a backpack. They don't have a witness to this. They don't have even a complainant whose backpack it is, th who they claim. They claim, but so— I mean, if you if you think of it, whenever you see uh, or hear of these kind of stories, you you take for granted because the news says that this person is guilt or is arrested for robbery and or murder or something, but you don't know the circumstances, so the news is not really telling you that what what actually happened is my mom finally let Khalif out on his six at, at 16 years old to go to a birthday party. I mean, she didn't like him out and about at night. Yeah, she, we, we weren't actually allowed out. We had privileges as we got older, 16 being that, to then be able to have an 11 o'clock curfew. Well, that's what she gave him. And um, on his way back home, when she was on his way home, he was stopped by police, and the backpack that he had was his. He didn't have a stolen backpack, but officers see a black person coming home or in the street at a late time. They kind of figure, probably, that this kid or this person has drugs or something that we can get. So they stopped him with the assumption or the allegation that he stole a backpack to search in his backpack to see if he probably had drugs or something. But when they didn't find that, they had to make up an allegation that there was someone that said and reported that he stole their backpack. And they changed the story three times. They said they, he stole the backpack um, two hours before. Then it was two days before, then in the precinct during um, tr uh, the court in the court, they changed it to two weeks before. They kept on changing the story three different times to accommodate what they what their goal was, which is just to give another black pa black man or young boy a felony. Hmm. That's the goal. 
So he's put in jail. <clears throat> How does he end up in solitary for 800 days? Khalif didn't didn't want to be around um, <coughs> didn't, didn't want to be around the 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 crap that goes on. Excuse me, but the crap that goes on in Rikers, which is it's a gladiator school. You go there to learn how to fight, to def to defend your life, to like fight until the day that you are released. And so Khalif, when he got there, knowing that he's not a part of any gangs, he's not a part of any aff affiliations, yet when they put him in a blood house, he has to fend for his life. So constantly having to fight, and then the re repercussion of fighting is going to uh, solitary confinement. Or his mouth, he's a 16-year-old, and officers who beat him, he then lost respect. Wait, I want to talk about this, officers who beat him. Yeah. Some remarkable video The New Yorker magazine <clears throat> got originally showed what happened to Khalif. And as we show the video, um, let me narrate it for our radio audience. A guard is waiting outside his cell, takes Khalif out, and he's shackled, Khalif. And suddenly, the guard jumps him, takes him down, throws him on the ground. Another guard then joins in this. When you look at two. this video, two other guards yes. join in. What happened here? When was this? Did Khalif tell you about this at the time? Absolutely. Khalif actually gave extensive detail, because at that point, he rem the only way we could get these videos is because we had to subpoena the court for the date and time. They don't just let you get the whole entire time while he was in jail. Khalif knew the date and time when this happened. Being that smart, he knew what was coming. So what he did was, <clears throat> he remembered the date and time and the officer. What happened in that scenario is, um, the officer brought him out the cell, said something smart to Khalif, and Khalif told us that, you know, he's, he started talking about him, like Khalif, like, Khalif was a piece of crap. And so, Khalif spoke back to him and said something smart. But he's a, he's a kid. Why, why, as an adult, you're getting offended by a, chi a, a, a young adult or a teenager at this point? But then he decides, I'm going to take out my, my bad day that I'm having or my anger that I have against kids, and I want to put them in their place. You're, you're, a high, you're an overpriced babysitter. That's what you are. And there's <clears throat> another scene um, that The New Yorker got a hold of, this video inside the prison, of other prisoners beating on Khalif as he tries to save himself. And you see guards there. And we're going to play this right now. But what are they doing? They're sort of standing in the midst of it. So what guards, happened here? The guards in this video has a pro, it has um, rules that they have or precautions they have to follow. When there's something like this, they are told they have to they have an emergency panic button. Officers then raid that that house or that on um, that cell block. Yet they haven't done it once. And then to put him meaning they haven't hit the button. They haven't once. hit the button once, and they're standing there because they know they're they perpetuated this fight. The, 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 they, they spit in his um, in Kali's face, the, the inmate, or the detainees, spit in Kali's face because they were trying to break him. And the officers told him at that time, we're going to break you. And that's exactly what they were trying to do. But you see, that gate that they put him in is called the A and B gate. That A and B gate is locked Right, he's in a tiny area with all of these other prisoners. You see this right here? He's in a—in between—when they put, uh, put him inside, that's the A and B gate. It's mechanically locked. It can't get open from a kick. So they had to press the button so that more inmates could come and then continue his, their savage um, assault on Khalif. But officers still had, at that point, a chance to press their button, and they didn't. I want to then go to Khalif, once he's out. Uh, and this is a clip we played in part one of our conversation with you, but I want to go back to this. Um, I want to go to the clip that we played um, when he's talking to HuffPost Live's Mark Lamont Hill. Um, as he's talking about attempting suicide um, when he's in solitary confinement. I would say I committed suicide about five to six, five or six times. Okay, you attempted suicide five to six times? Yes. While all, in, while, all while still in prison? Yes. Wow. And I, 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 try, I tried to resort to telling the correction officers that I wanted to um, see a psychiatrist or a counselor, something. I was telling them I need mental help because I wasn't feeling right. All, all the stress from my case, everything was just getting to me, and I just, 
I just couldn't take it. I just needed somebody to talk to. I needed to just let, 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 I just needed to be, I just needed to talk and be stress free. But the correction officers, they didn't want to hear me out. Nobody wanted to listen. That's Khalif, your brother. And I'm sorry to, um, you know, to have you have to see him here, although maybe in some way it um, is helpful. Is it in any way to see him or is it painful? Or it's, both? Now that with the loss of my mom, it's more painful. She was fighting for justice, for, for him to have some kind of, for her to rest his case at least. And she hasn't, she hasn't gotten that, and she's already passed now. So he's describing attempting suicide. Talk about what happened when he's in solitary and he attempts suicide. What happens to him there? How do they care for him? Care is a, is a really far stretch of a word, because the care that they gave him was, we're going to reprimand you for trying to take your life. So what they did was, when Khalif stepped outside of his cell to slice his wrist, because he was calling for attention while he was in the cell, he was calling for attention, and no one gave him attention for more than two, for two days. On the second day, when they opened his cell, he slit his wrist, and um, they beat him for it. They held him against the cell in a chokehold while up against his cell while he's bleeding, and the care that they gave him was, we're going to wrap your arm up to stop the bleeding and then throw you back in your cell with no I mean he did it for attention so that he can be so he can talk and relieve himself I mean what what person doesn't want to have human contact after being in, in solitary confinement and he couldn't take it especially being innocent can you imagine what he was thinking man why do I have to go through this like I didn't do anything and then all of a sudden I have to slice my wrist to get attention. He wasn't suicidal. Just so you know, he, he, he attempted suicide because of all the things that he went through. But before he was home, he was never suicidal. Khalif was, if, if anything, a strong kid. Let's go back to Khalif talking uh, on HuffPost Live. If you say anything that could tick them off in any type of way, some of them, which is a lot of them, what they do is they starve you, they, they won't feed you, and it's already hard in there because if you get the three trays that you get every day, you're still hungry because I guess that's part of the punishment. So if they starve you one tray, that, that, that could really make an impact on you. And How much were you starved? I, I, I was starved a lot. I can't even, I can't even count. Khalif was starved, and to put it more clearly, breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast, lunch, he didn't get till dinner, where they would then give him a tray of cabbage. And Khalif tried to make it right. You know, in one of the visits, he told me that, um, you know, they gave me cabbage, but at least they, they gave me bread and cabbage. I didn't eat the bread, because Khalif was very much—he wanted to be fit. And so he's like, but I eat the healthy stuff. I, I ate all the cabbage. How do you—I mean, he's trying to make it right in his mind. And that's what I heard when he told me, I'm sitting in this, in this visit with him. And he's like, but I came, I, I ate the, um, the cabbage. And I'm sitting there, like, wanting to cry, but I can't let him see that I'm going to cry, because he has to be strong. He, he's going back in there. And yet, he's only eating cabbage after breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast, lunch, and then— Which he didn't get. He, which all he didn't get. Meals, yes, all those meals, I'm sorry. Served. He wasn't served. He wasn't served. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, then the next day, breakfast, lunch. So he hadn't eaten for a day and three quarters, and then they give him a— And then they gave him a tray of, of cabbage, cabbage. And bread. And bread which he didn't eat the bread. Like, what, what they're saying is, we're going to break you. And that's the goal. You had said that they beat him after he attempted suicide? Yeah. So what, what they, the officers, if, you're, if you make the officers work, and they're, they're just ba and babysitters. If you make the officers work, they're mad. So work is, I have to do paperwork now? You made my shift hard. I'm about to leave, and now I got to do paperwork. I'm going to hurt you. And this is what they did to him, all, in, all because, one, he, he needed attention. You can't stop a person from getting it. You, you shouldn't have to stop a person from getting attention. Just give him attention, for on God's sake. But he's not human. When you're on Rikers, you're not considered human. You're considered uh, what the world thinks is a felon or a criminal. Yet you're innocent until proven guilty. Were you working at Rikers at the time that he was in there? Yeah, so I, I wasn't a, a correctional officer. I don't want anyone to get that confused. I was hired as an engineer. And what does an engineer do? 
I, in Rikers, it translated to me being GI, or which is gang intelligence. Like, whenever they had searches, they would put us in, put us to go in the cell and search their belongings and find weapons. And when I'm not doing that, I was fixing cells and um, doing their fire alarm system and stuff of that nature. But I didn't work for Rikers. I worked for the Department of Corrections, so I only, I went to Rikers from time to time, but throughout the time that I was working, which was a year and a half, I went to all these facilities, Manhattan House, The Boat, Brooklyn and House. And The Boat is? The, bo the Boat is a barge um, where they, in the middle, it's in between the Bronx and Queens, and it's just in the water, and they have inmates or human beings on a barge, which is what, it looks like a garbage barrage where they have these big um, trailers, and this is where humans are being stored. Describe visiting <clears throat> Khalif with your mom. What did you go through to get in to see him? What I went through, I, I mean, I'm going to describe what my mother went through, because what I, when, I, when you go through it, you're not seeing it as prevalent as when you're watching your mother being told to shake her bra. And she's like, what do you—I remember the first time she didn't understand that concept. So the woman guard goes and shakes her bra, puts her hand through the lining of her bra, then puts her hand through the lining of her, your pants, and then pats you down, and you're being violated by, a, by whether it's a male or a woman, because, you know, sometimes it's a man. And that person could then fight and say, no, I want a woman to do this. But the women are rough, first of all. My mother attested to that. But then on top of that, sometimes you just want to see your son, and they say, I don't have a, a, a woman officer, so you either let me search you or you have to wait. And you know that that woman officer will not come, because there's women officers that walk past, but she's not allowed to do searches. Are you serious? I've waited for s sometimes four hours, four hours to have a 45-minute visit, sometimes a 20-minute visit, and then the alarms go off, and then the visit's over. They have to then shuffle these inmates or detainees or human beings back into their cages, so and then you're shuffled out of there, so you only—you went through a six-hour wait so then only see your son or brother for 20 minutes. And let's be clear, Rikers Island, which what's like 7,500 people at any one time, 75,000? Well, actually, it's 70,000 people uh, are put through the system a year. And yet, I mean, just two years ago, nor last year, uh, to, uh, ending 2014, there was 14,000 people that stayed there as detainees prolonged. So, 80 percent of those people are not charged or convicted of a crime. They no. are just there. Often, they can't afford the bail or bond to get out awaiting trial. Rikers is just holding people who cannot afford to bail themselves out. Khalif had a $3,000 bail, right? But it was 10000 It's just the percentage that they say that's needed is only 3000 Only 3000 is kind of hard for a mother who doesn't have financial uh, support. She, I mean, the husband is an estranged, 16-year estranged husband, who now is ad advantageous because, since he's technically the husband, he technically is deserving of 50 percent or 100 percent of my, the, the Khalif's estate. But when, at the time, Khalif only needed 3000 to be bailed out, and my mother couldn't afford that, and we couldn't get the money up. Besides, we also thought they were going to release him because he didn't do anything. But as time went on, they started offering him 15 years. This scared Khalif. On a visit one time, I'm like, Khalif, just, you know what, take the seven. Take seven years. I was, I was telling him this. Take seven years in prison? Because they offered 15. And I'm like, no, this is not possible. But then my mother is getting really worried, like, 15 years, my son's going to be in 15 years, come out at 30 years old? We can't do this. So then they then co uh, come to you with a better offer, seven years. And we're like, Khalif, just take it, because, like, the, 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 the attorney he had, the public defender, was telling him, this is the best you're going to get, was telling him that, you know, they're being generous, but if you go to, uh, go to trial, they can give you the max of 14, uh, 15 years. So, so then it scares you that when you hear seven years, you know, I'm going to take it. But Khalif, he was actually strong. I, I remember visiting him one separate time where I'm like, Khalif, they don't have nothing on you. This is a game that they play. But who knew it was going to be three years? And most of that time in solitary confinement. More than half.
Earlier this year, Vanita Browder, uh, Khalif and Akeem's mom, spoke at the America Justice Summit and described the day she found Khalif's body hanging from the side of their home. I was home uh, alone with him, and he, we had a little discussion earlier, and I was at a loss as to what to do. I didn't know what to do, how to really, you know, help him, because he, he became very paranoid, very paranoid. Worried about getting beaten or attacked. Yes, and I tried talking to him, so he went upstairs, and I was just laying on my bed, and he came in, he said, Ma, that was his thing. Ma, you all right? I said, yeah, I'm okay. He went back upstairs, and I hear all this moving. So I figured, you know, he was in his brother's room, he's situating the room so he could get comfortable and watch TV. Then I hear him pacing from one room to the other, but when Khalif is upset, he paces. So I didn't pay attention. Then all of a sudden, I hear this loud noise and I'm like, oh my goodness, the child then threw his brother's TV out the window. But I said, he can't because there's bars. So I said, wait a minute, I go upstairs, I went in his brother's room, nothing. Then I went in the other room and he had kicked out the air conditioner covers and I saw this gold rope thing and I ran downstairs and when I opened the backyard door, his foot, one of his feet was on the, the bar of the gate. And I said, Khalif, stop playing. Th this is not a joke, it's not funny. I said, Khalif. And then I got afraid to open the door all the way in case it was my fault that the, he, you know, he snapped. But when I, pe when I looked up, his head was just hanging back. He was gone. And that loud noise was his body banging up against the house. That's your mom. Vanita Browder, describing the suicide of your brother. You just lost your mom a few weeks ago, and I'm so sorry to um, play this for you right now. You know, my, my mom, she had to, like, deal with the thought that, like, <clears throat> she thought that she did this to Khalif. Sorry. <clears throat> She thought that she was the responsible one for um, what happened to Khalif because uh, she let him out that day to go to a birthday party. <clears throat> but now, like, I mean, it's hard to hear my mother's voice because, like, she always spoke of Khalif. Like, it was her life as though, like, she had had no other kids. Like, she loved her 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 niece and uh, her grand gr grandchildren. It's like a chance to like help or protect them since she lost Khalif, but. Then she would go back to being, like, an advocate for Khalif at all points, and it's just sad to hear my mom's voice because, like, I was, me and my mom had a really strong connection, and we still do. Like, I, I, I'm I, not embarrassed to say this, but a little, it's and my mom visits me at night now. Like, I, 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 I dream of her often. I, she talks to me. Like, I can't sleep at night because I'm hearing my mom, but to hear her on, like, her actual voice speaking, it's like. Man, I, 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 I'm, my family's relocating to the cemetery. They're, 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 my brothers are depressed now. Like, they don't want to live without mommy. My, my, when it happened to Khalif, it's like, you know what? I, I was angry. I was, I was sad. I was hurt. I, they took my, this is my buddy. Like, he, he was my workout buddy. He was, when he, we had this relation since he's been in jail, I was in jail. We, we both related because he loved Tupac. So, like, he, he was, like, he was my buddy. He was, we were real close, actually. And at night, sometimes, when he couldn't sleep, I'd, he called me. I'd drive over to my mother's house, pick him up, drive down Pelham Parkway, and I'd notice he, he, within, like, four minutes, five minutes tops, he's sleeping in my passenger seat. And he, but it would hurt me, because while he's sleeping, I'm seeing him twitch as though he's fighting while he's sleeping. This jail never left him. The torture they did to him never left him. So while he's in a, in a car seat, relaxed because he couldn't sleep at home, he's now in the car seat sleeping and fighting in his dreams. <laughs> I mean, while he was home, people said, and I hate the term that people say he was paranoid, but Khalif wasn't paranoid. It, it's not paranoia that happened. When he came home, off, un, uh, unmarked police cars would sit on the corner of my mother's block and 
when he comes outside, they would chase him back in by driving past the house and going like that with their hands, not with like the actual gun. making the form of a gun. Of a gun. And they would go like this when he comes out like the house. Like he's shooting it. Like and they're shooting it. Yeah. And he would run inside, tell my mom. My mom would go outside and not see it. But then after a while, we started catching him on camera. So my mom would call me, because I'm seven minutes away from my mother's house. I would drive over there, and I'd see the car, and I'd walk past it, but it's tinted. It's an unmarked car. And I'd go inside, and when he, when he comes out, same thing, all the time. And then on top of that, before he passed, the night before, he got a text that said, we warned you. The morning of, he took his life around in the afternoon, in around 12 o'clock. The morning of, his cell phone, were on, he had a second text, unknown number, we warned you. Kali wasn't paranoid. He was being chased. He was being coerced into uh, taking his life. Because when you have a person on, uh, he, he was on a medication, starts with an R, I just can't remember the name, but um, not Ritalin, but um, he was on a depression medication that has a, st a, a statistic of if you give it to a, a person between the age of 11 and uh, 21, it's a 17 percent risk of suicide. <laughs> They were, in every way, teaching him and prodding him to commit suicide. This, do, do you have any idea who those people were in the tinted car, tinted they, windows? They were definitely officers. Khalif got sh and what people don't know is Khalif got shot in December 21st, uh, December 21st of uh, 2015. Um, no, of 2014, sorry. Khalif was shot in the abdomen, sent to uh, St. Barnabas, where my mother passed. And Later, in, recently. Le yeah. Just recently. And um, he was in intensive care. But there, he was irate, because they gave him medication. He was considered a John Doe. But they're giving a John Doe medication, not knowing that he's on this medication that they gave him, which made him really irate. So he's cranking. I got up there. They tried to keep me in the waiting room. I ran up. I'm, not, I'm seeing my brother. I went in there. I hear him say, Akeem, Akeem, calling for me. And it made me more like, Oh, my God, what's going on? What are they doing to my brother? Behind curtains, he's calling, Akeem, Akeem, what are they doing? They're trying to kill me. I go in behind the curtain. Kali sees me, but he's still calling Akeem. I'm like, what did you... I went to the nurse. What did you put... What, what are you doing to him? He was handcuffed to the bed while he's being... while he's shot in intensive care, internal bleeding. From... He wasn't in prison at the time, was no, he? No, no, this shot? is home. So why would they handcuff him? because they said he was being irate. They're, he's being irate because you gave him medication against what he was already taking, probably made it, I, I'm, not, I'm not the medical person, but for them to do what they did, and no responsibility is given at all. So there's a, there's a, 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 movie, a, a docu-series coming out from uh, the producers that uh, came to my family uh, called Time, the, Khalid, the story of Khalid Browder. It comes out January 11th of 2017. This is Jay Z is involved with this and Spike yes. TV. Yes, and um, Jenna First is the producer. Um, Who and, did Orange Is the New Black? Yes, yeah. Uh huh. And um, all these, all, all everything that, so we've we seen in the the movie the 13th or the document. 13th, or the documentary, yeah, 13th, documentary. It's stuff that a we've Ava already. DuVernay. It's stuff that we've already seen of Kali. Mm. Five minutes worth, but. This is telling them the real story. So you'll hear the real story of, like, he was shot or how they were taunting him. He was arrested. Who shot him? Khalif, you know what? They told, uh, Khalif told us it was a white person. In my mother's neighborhood, there's no white people. It's black and Hispanic predominantly. But when you hear of a white person, you're, I mean, he doesn't know. Where him. was he? Was this at night? Right in my, no, in the afternoon. Right in, uh, This is when he was a student at Bronx Community College? Yes. And he was shot in the abdomen, or, uh, in the like next to the building. He made it home, holding himself. Went upstairs, said he wanted to. Sl he he has to sleep it off. He he thought he was just gonna sleep it off. <laughs> Called the ambulance. They came, police came. They dropped the case within 24 hours, saying they have no leads, and that he shot himself. They said he shot himself. Yet he's saying. Some, a white person shot him. Now, of course, he doesn't know who it is because someone shot him. But they put. They said that he shot himself. I just wanted to read a quote of Jay Z, who said, "Khalif Browder is a modern-day prophet 
his story a failure of the judicial process. A young man—and I emphasize young man—who lost his life because of a broken system. His tragedy has brought atrocities to light, and now we must confront the issues and events that occurred so other young men can have a chance at justice. Those are the words of Jay-Z. When Khalif got out of jail, a number of celebrities reached out to him. Is that right? Was he—he he was on Oprah? He was, um, what do you call it, on a lot of shows, as you saw. Like, he was on The View. He was on um, other shows. I, and I how know. did that affect him? He—I mean, he was ecstatic to meet Jay-Z. Like, it's his idol. And yet, uh, I mean, I, I wish they would have, at the time when he was alive, taken it seriously that he doesn't need exposure, he doesn't need a basketball game to go to. It's nice. I really appreciate them doing this. I just wish they would have, like, said, you know what, after this game, we're going to, like, hook you up and send you to counseling or therapy or s help you with the, the, the fact that you can't sleep at night, something. Because it does take finances to do this. Now, what, what the Department of Corrections or what the de Blasio says about resources, 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 he, I went to a meeting and he was speaking of resources. I went to a meeting just last week, Wednesday. And he's speaking of resources in which why he couldn't get justice reform, his thing that he was advocating for, why it's not making any effect, because there's no resources. These resources people have. These are, these are celebrities or people in high places that can provide counseling for a family that you destroyed, that can provide help because my mother literally broke down and couldn't do anything unless it was related to Khalif. I mean, she tried—she started a, a Sweets by V, like, she, she was a baker. She baked so many, like, different cupcakes and things, but she called it Khalif's Cupcakes, like, she had a specialty, Khalif's Cupcakes. It was KK, right? And um, she only did things when it came to Khalif, but when it was anything other than Khalif, she would break down. She could not perform in, in the way that she was. I mean, we're used to seeing our mother do everything, Thanksgiving, making, but, like, no, none of this, because it wasn't related to Khalif. That means she needs help. That means take some time to humanize, make her human again, and not this machine that just goes up to Albany and fights for justice and then doesn't get it. We fought for Khalif Browder law. We needed 34 votes. We got 31. And this was the law that— For a speedy trial, sorry about uh, Speedy trial is— um, was uh, is a is a the the, the Khalif Browder law Browder law brings up the uh, inconsistencies and the ways that the uh, court gets around not uh, or allows for someone like Khalif to go to court 38 different times without having a um, a hearing. He's a kid in jail, 38 different times, and the uh, prosecutor kept saying, "I want this extended." I I I'm, we're not ready. They play a game. So, Close Rikers, um, they, they helped, helped bring it to light by helping, like, advocate for this up in Albany. And um, what, they, what, what they brought to light is, you know, we've, we've brought over 100 cases from the time span of this year, January to February, over 100 cases, proving what they do, which is they'll play a game with the, um, with the time clock. They say, we're not ready. And then when, three days later, behind the, the, the person, the detainee who goes to, uh, to Rikers, when he's not in court, they go to the uh, judge and say, we're ready. Now that they're ready, your clock stops, because the DA's ready to prosecute. But then they bring him back, and the excuse they give in over 100 cases is, we can't find the, um, the witness or um, the officers on vacation. And then now he goes back to Rikers. They're not ready, right? Because he Three doesn't days. have the 500 or 1,000 or 3,000 dollars bond where he would be waiting at home. But what not the DA in then does is three days later go back to the judge and file an injunction saying we're ready. We found the witness or the officer. We know what date he's going to come back. This is a game, a really disgusting game because all you had to do is bring the person in and say. I mean, we have the right to be to face our accuser, don't we? I mean, this is America. We're not in. I mean. I, you know, America's never been great. So if you if you go to any other country, I mean, I, I've been to Europe where they're they're baffled by our our, our establishment of um, the judicial system. 
or our correction our correction system. They've never heard of it. I mean, 60 Minutes, and they, they did an interview with me, and they're, we don't do this to our people. And it's not even thought of to do it to um, teenagers. So you want to shut down Rikers? I want to I want to attack any jail that has mass incarceration and solitary confinement. Because right now we're given lip service from um, people like De Blasio, who says they're going to do and make changes that uh, are effective, yet go behind our back and hire sixteen hundred new officers a month after saying we're going to close Rikers. He's like, we're going to do whatever it takes to to um, get these people off of Rikers and reduce the population so that we can close it. However, then you go behind our back and hire 16 new, uh, 1,600 new officers. And then, to make it worse, to perpetuate it, what they're doing is, and what they just passed the bill is, to have live ammunition and, and tasers on Rikers Island. Tasers. They already passed that. So tasers are now are, are, are in Rikers, where you control that on the, the population. You already control them. No one's been needing tasers. Why now introduce that and then live ammunition? You want bullets on Rikers? And then what, make up a story like they always do? They say, when I was there, nothing leaves Rikers. And I'm not there now, so even when I was there, I wasn't following by this rule. They let the bridge up. When an when a assault happens, a slicing, a murder, they let— they. Open the bridge so no uh, tra trans transportation could go through, and then create their story. And they say what they, and what needs to be said is this. They put those guards that probably is going to be ag against it or not for it, but they introduce these other guards. They're on the shift for now, while the other one is filling out paperwork, so called. And then they let the bridge down. Reporters come in, and boom! Now we have the story the way we want to tell it. That's corruption. Not correction. Akeem, is there anything else you want to add? Um, thank you. I um, I did want to uh, say that because there's a lot of supporters that on um, that support the campaign to shut down Rikers and what we're trying to do, which is bring the um, prison population down and also have a vision of a jail-free NYC, which uh, closed Rikers, led by Just Leadership Glenn Martin and a lot of um, their supporters. They've uh, they've been very supportive of our family and uh, their. Um, we're a shut down Rikers and they're closedrikers.org, and we have also likewise. And your website is? Is shutdownrikers.net. And are you bringing suit against New York City, your family? Yes, we have a current uh, the lawsuit that my mother was on, that my my mother was doing in in Khalif's name. We're we're now picking it up as the brother and my sister. Well, Akeem, again, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, the older brother of Khalif Browder, who committed suicide in 2015 after spending three years at Rikers Island without trial. Akeem also lost his mother in this last month, as Akeem and his family says Vanita Browder died of a broken heart. Akeem founded Campaign to Shut Down Rikers. I'm Amy Goodman. This is Democracy Now! Go to democracynow.org to see part one of our conversation with Akeem and also talking about the film that's now out called Rikers.